Hi, I'm Dan Olson. Uh, we just wrapped up another successful lean product meetup. Tonight's speaker was Alberto Savoya. His new book, The Right It, just came out two days ago. Uh, Alberto is a successful entrepreneur and teacher at Stanford. He worked at Google where he was the first engineering director and he learned the hard way with some startups about the law of market fail failure, which he shared with us tonight, some ex advice on how to test your ideas um, without actually building things, right? So a lean startup approach, philosophy, with a lot of great examples, a lot of great tangible frameworks and advice, and a lot of frankly funny stories. Everyone was laughing a lot. So he, he spoke at the meetup four years ago. He's very smart, very engaging, very funny. So I think you're gonna enjoy it. He's gonna give you some specific tactical tips. If you have an idea, you know, most ideas fail, and he talks about why, and he talks about how basically to come up with tests to test your ideas and check it out. So I think you're gonna enjoy it. Um, again, he's got lots of funny examples. He got someone from the audience to uh, pretend they worked at McDonald's, so it's a lot of fun. And if you like the video again, be sure to like it down below, subscribe to our channel so you get notified when our next awesome new speakers get published as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this works. So, uh, you hear me well? Good, so thank you for coming. It's, a, it's an honor for me to be here. But frankly, I don't do this a lot, so it's also an honor for you to have me here. <laughs> and uh, for that, you have to thank uh, the awesome Dan. Uh, because, uh, as I said, very few public appearances. I'm, I'm, I play hard to get. Yes, it does. Uh, and I also want to thank Google, without, who's, uh, without their support, none of this prototyping stuff would have happened, because basically they turned me loose to do these things. And also, uh, Stanford allowed me to teach it, so I could learn that the stuff I'm teaching is actually good, because it's quite an honor to be teaching it at Stanford. So what I teach you today is stuff that has been proven to work, no marketing, no BS, call me, call me on it, right? I'm an engineer, so this is uh, stuff that's supposed uh, to work. So this is my battle cry these days, failure bites, bite back. And how did I come to this uh, battle cry? Well, I have to tell you about my failure experience. As you can probably tell from my accent, I was not born here. How many of you were not born here? Cool, yes. I mean, I meant in this room. <laughs> no, no, never mind. So, so I, I was born in Italy and together like pizza I came to America and I became uh, bigger and uh, uh, better in some ways, <laughs> more commercialized. And uh, so what do you do? I, I landed in Silicon Valley and I was lucky enough in uh, 85, I joined my first startup, a little company that actually was in the building across the street called Sun Microsystems. I was uh, one of the early employees there. Uh, I joined because I just love the Sun workstation. And uh, I was there for 13 years. Toward the end, I worked uh, on Java. And as you probably know, Sun had a pretty good run until the run kind of uh, stopped. Uh, you know, the stock went from $10 to $200. And that, those were the first stock options I ever had. So I thought, wow, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> startups seem to be easy and they're, they're good. I, I want to do my own. So I left Sun and I did my first startup called uh, Velogic and we raised $3 million and uh, 18 months later we received an acquisition offer for 18, uh, $100 million. Do you think we accepted that offer? Are you crazy? Of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> right? Come on, that's uh, 2001. Yeah, 100, 100 million, that was real, uh, real money. So of course, by the time he closed the stock, he went up and down. But anyway, I thought, well, you know, this is easy. Why doesn't everybody do it? So I called my friends in Italy and said, hey, Mario, come to America. It's good. Let's, let's do a startup together. Um, so after my, the company was acquired, I spent one year at the acquiring company to make sure we had a good product transition. And then I thought, OK, I want to do another startup. And in the meantime, uh, this other little startup called Google uh, was starting. And I, I thought, well, it's a, cool name and I went there and interviewed and I learned that they had uh, free food so that was good enough for me. Uh, so I joined at the, as the first engineering director and among other teams I led the group that uh, launched AdWords which now makes what hundred billion dollars a year so that looks pretty good in an engineering resume. And I thought well you know I'm, I'm kind of good at this. So I thought look if startups are so easy and I'm good at this Forget Google, you know, they're gonna do well without me. I'm gonna do another startup. So I did, but this time I thought, okay, look, if I raise $3 million, 
and we're offered $100 million, if I raise $30 million, I can make $1 billion, right? So we, we, we came close to uh, those $30 million. We actually raised $25 million over uh, three rounds of funding. And we developed this product called Agitator, a Java automated testing tool that won every possible award in the world for, for, for engineering. Uh, and customers told us, please build this, we'll buy it. You know, so we were already, I was already shopping for private jets. And then, uh, and that's, I was starting to say, look, I'm really good. You know, I thought, I'm the Italian Steve Jobs. <laughs> Stefano Giobini, that sounds good. I almost changed my name, right? And then, but what happened that five years later, uh, you know, all those people that told us, your product is fantastic, build it and we will buy it in tons. That didn't materialize. So this time, instead of thinking, you know, I'm good and this is easy, my response was a little different. <laughs> and uh, uh, I coined an acronym that uh, we all know now, Why the Failure, WTF. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, you know, how is it possible? I did all these great things. You know, I thought, I'm destined for success. How could I, Alberto Savoia, have failed? So I went back to Google. Uh, they took me back. And at the time, even Google started to experience some failure with their product, right? Not every Google product is successful. So uh, in addition to being an engineer, engineering director, I started to study failure uh, and innovation, uh, failure, especially in innovation. I became uh, the innovation agitator and I collected a set of tools, techniques and tactics to beat failure, which I called prototyping. And these tools, techniques and tactics work so well that after a while, people were starting to ask for them. So I wrote a little book. 72 pages, I wrote it in one week, uh, and people started to invite me to give talks, and then they dragged me to Stanford to, uh, to give presentations there. So my title changed, and became Innovation Agitator and Doctor of Philosophy. Because <laughs> I honestly don't think there's a person on the planet that has looked as failure with as much anger <laughs> and resolve to fight failure uh, than I have, right? Because it really passed on me. And not just failure due to incompetence, failure that, you know, it's kind of inexplicable, at least at the time. So uh, I started teaching this and it worked out very well. So that's what I decided to do full time. So that's my background. So let's talk about failure. First of all, I like to define it very clearly. To me, failure, the simplest definition is this. You launch an, a product, you have an idea, you have some expectations. Then you launch it in the market, you get results. If the results are less than the expectations, that's what I call failure. So you build 10,000 widgets and you sell two, that's failure. Uh, on the other hand, if you build 10,000 widgets and you sell 10,000 and then take orders for 10,000 more, that's success, right? Very simple. By the way, I talk about products, but it could be a service, it could be a new business, it could be an initiative, right? It could even be a law. Uh, so with that definition, the key there is expectations. And the first thing I notice about failure is that you have to be very clear about what the expectations are. So when I ask people, what is your idea? They usually wave their hand and they give me some kind of uh, uh, very fuzzy uh, description of what their product is and the market is. So one of the things I learned at Google is this expression, say it with numbers. Uh, and this has saved me a lot of headaches. So how do you say it with number? I created the simplest possible thing that anybody that wants to talk to me about their idea I tell them, do not come back to me until you've given, you're able to put your idea into what I call an XYZ hypothesis, right? XYZ hypothesis are very simple. Whatever your idea is, I want you to express it as X percent of Y will do Z. So X percent is a percentage, Y is your expected target market, and Z is what, a description of what you expect the market to do with your idea. So you, you notice the word there, expect, hey, hi. <laughs> see a lot of people I know here. Uh, you see the word expect, expect a lot here. So let me give you an example. Here's an idea, second day sushi. This was, some Stanford student came up with this uh, a few years ago. And we were sitting down and they were eating this packaged sushi and they said, man, why is it $9? I said, well, because it has to be fresh fish. And the guy said, I'm young, I have a strong stomach. It doesn't have to be that fresh. So. So there were MBA students that thought, we have an arbitrary situation. I can buy sushi that expires in about four hours uh, for 25 cents on the dollar, and I can sell it for uh, 50 cents on the dollar. But of course, they didn't express it that way. They're, they said, look, people, lots of them, especially students, they, they like sushi, they cannot afford it, but if it's cheap enough, they will buy it. So I told them, okay, that's good. Let's create an XYZ hypothesis. So that's what we came up with this. By the way, 
You see what's wrong with these people? Who are these people? Right? You have to be pretty specific. Lots of them. How many is lots? And you know, cheap, cheap enough. What is cheap enough? Right? So when you use set with numbers, I force them to write something in XYZ hypothesis form that ends up looking like this. 20% of packaged sushi buyers will buy second the sushi if it's half the price of regular sushi. Now, where do you come up with these numbers? We'll talk about it later. But at the, the beginning, they can be guesses. Right? You can guess this is what it is. But just the act of putting it, putting it down into numbers really clarifies your thinking. Right, so we're clear. Failure is when your expectations fall short, when your results fall short of your expectations. And to do that, you have to be very clear about your expectations. So the XYZ hypothesis, I would say, is my number one favorite tool. If I'm given five minutes with a team, and only have five minutes to teach them something, I tell them, write down your XYZ hypothesis. Simpler than anything else. And if you cannot come up with it, then you know, you're not ready for business. So now, that, now we talk about the definition of failure. Let's talk about the law of market failure. It starts pretty bad with two parts. Part one, most new ideas will fail in the market. And then it goes downhill from there, uh, even if competently executed. So, so let me unpack it. We probably know, you know, a lot of product managers here. You, know, you probably know most new ideas fail in the market. And if you don't, just go and look online. My favorite source is Nielsen Research. Every year they look at thousands, uh, tens of thousands of new product launches. And every year the results, they are the same. About 80% of the project, products, usually 85%, fail. They disappoint or they cancel. In other words, the expectations were here and the products came here, here, or here every single year. And these are companies we all know about, right? Uh, the Disney, the Pro Procter & Gamble, these are not people that don't know what they're doing. So any questions? Does anybody disagree with the, this part of the law of market failure? No, right, you shouldn't. Uh, you know, this, ha this just happens. Uh, if it hasn't happened to you, you've just been very, very lucky uh, so far. Now, the second part, people give me more trouble, said, what do you mean fail even if competently executed? These people fail because they're morons, right? They don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing, I'm not going to fail. Well, not exactly, right? So if you go and look at successful companies, you go and look at their failures, you find out that they fail just as much as, uh, uh, as most of us, right? In fact, if you go on Google and you type Google, uh, Google failures, one of the pages you get is a Pinterest page called the Google Graveyard, which has a list of all the Google uh, failures. Apparently, it was created by a Microsoft product manager, <laughs> uh, right? And it was having a bad day. Uh, and so, of course, a, a Google product manager having a bad day created the Microsoft Morgue, which has even more failed products, right? And we can sit here and make fun of Google and Microsoft, but the reality is that these two companies together are almost worth you know, one and a half trillion dollars, right? And in fact, when people come you know, from outside Silicon Valley, we're pretty familiar with failure. They're terrified of failure, right? There are some countries in, in Europe where if you fail, you go into entrepreneurial prison. You cannot do a startup for another 10 years. And there are you know, other parts of the world where basically if you fail, they give you, you know, a little samurai sword and you, you, they tell you to dispatch yourself. Right? People take failure very seriously for every thousand miles that you move away from Silicon Valley. Right? Uh, you know, I'm Italian, I know. If I, when I told my mother that my company failed, she almost disowned me. So this stuff happens. So uh, most new ideas fail even if competently executed because the same people that fail with products like Google Wave, some of you may, may remember them, or Google Buzz, were the same geniuses that came up with Google Maps and, uh, you know, and, and Gmail. So it's the same people, the same company, the same benefit, the free foods, the free massages, everything. <laughs> right? The free engineers, just some of them succeed and some of them fail. Uh, the law of failure doesn't play favorite. So after this kind of dire statistics, I started to analyze, okay, but why are all of these ideas failing? So I, I looked at thousands of failure in every possible industry and I put them into three basic categories because I wanted this nice acronym, FLOP, right? Uh, so failure due to launch, operations, or premise. Failure due to launch means that here's your product, here's your market, and somehow your, prod your market doesn't know about the product, so marketing doesn't work, or you can they cannot get their hands on your product, so distribution doesn't work. In other words, they do not know about your product or they cannot get their hands on it. Failure due to operation means that your product doesn't work, right? The app crashes, your car doesn't start, your service uh, doesn't work. Failure due pr to premise means people just don't give a damn about your product or not enough people. Uh, which one of these do you think is responsible for almost all failures? 
the last one, premise, right? Uh, so just no question. And yet, as an engineer, I, I spent most of the time making sure that I built the most beautiful, or if you're a designer, the most uh, you know, beautifully designed product. But the worst that happens, I spent five years building this beautifully designed, beautifully working product that people did not care enough. So that led me to this conclusion that most new ideas fail because they're not the right it. Uh, and I try to stay away from the word good idea and bad idea for a very simple reason. Nobody ever wakes up in the morning and said, I have a really bad idea, I'm gonna start a company <laughs> to build it, right? So all these companies that fail, all these products that fail, at some point people thought, hey, this is a good idea, right? So I thought, we need another term. And I came up with the term uh, that you see there, which is the title of my book, The Right It, right? So what is the right it? The right it is an idea that, if competently executed, will succeed in the market. You see, because the goodness of an idea is, is an output. You cannot know at the beginning. We know it's not, you cannot know at the beginning. The wrong it is an idea that, even if competently executed, will fail in the market. Doesn't matter how much marketing, firework, or how beautifully designed it is, if people don't care about it, it will succeed. It will not succeed. Let me give you some examples of the right it and the wrong it. Big Mac, obviously, the right it. So, McDonald's trying to come up with new combinations, stuff to shove into hamburgers, you know, pineapple uh, 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 things. And most of the time, they fail. Right? So Arch Deluxe, McLean, a lot of these products fail. Same company, right? Coca-Cola, they write it. New Coke, not so much. Uh, anybody, you've all seen Star Wars, you know, probably one of the 3,000 sequels. How many people here have seen Howard the Duck? There's always a few in each audience, yes. <laughs> Do you know what the connection is between Howard the Duck and uh, Star Wars? Steven Spielberg, right? So, hey, in fact, it's the movie that Steven Spielberg did after Star Wars with 10 times the budget. So it had more money, more experience, the Steven Spielberg name, and for Pete's sake, it had ducks, and everybody likes ducks, right? <laughs> Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, Duck al Orange, ducks are cool. So this could not have failed, right? And yet, it kind of pretty embarrassing uh, flop. Gmail, hopefully all of you have a Gmail account. How many of you here tried Google Wave when it came out? Okay, good. Uh, how many waves did you write? 500, you're good. Who else had tried it? Yeah. Half of one wave. Half of one wave, yeah. You're, you're kind of skewing my results, 500, yeah. <laughs> so it kind of illustrates for every product, there is somebody who likes it. I'm sure there are fans of Howard the Duck that you know, they, 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 they're buying the Blu-ray Criterion collection of Howard the Duck. But unfortunately, so you, you obviously liked it, but it didn't meet the expectations of the adoption, right? Uh, and yet it's a Google product. Ford Mustang, Ford Edsel, same company, same result. So, you know, I could go on uh, for a long time. Here's the thing, competent execution plus a product that's the wrong it, failure 100% guaranteed. Which led me to my most uh, favorite phrase, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. Because I tell you, as, a, as an engineer or as a product manager, you know, you put so much time and effort to build a beautiful product, to design it beautifully, to work out the, e, the, the UI, and just to find out that it's not the right it. It just kills you. So make sure you're building it right, uh, building the right it before you build it right. Because here's the other thing. There, there is very little risk. Most of the ideas that you have or you're planning to work on you can build them. You ever doubt that you could build you know, the, the app or the company or open the restaurant? No, you can do it. The question is, should you uh, do it? Which brings us to the question, well, how do I know if an idea is the right it? Good question. And I would say, well, do not ask. Do not ask people what they think of your idea. That's where all kind of trouble starts. You combine ideas with opinions and you get into super dangerous territory because ideas live in a place I call Thoughtland. So you have an idea, there it is, pop, and then you tell people your idea, hey, cat cloning, what do you think? <laughs> so uh, people give you back their opinion. Now, ideas are abstract, opinions are abstract and subjective, plus, you know, you have your, either you don't like cat or you like cat too much or you're against cloning. Bottom line, you end up with this furball, right? of uh, opinions and abstractions, and it doesn't seem very dangerous, but actually that's where all the trouble starts. Because two horrible things happen in uh, innocuous looking Thoughtland. The first thing is that you have an idea and everybody thinks it's the best idea ever. Some of you may remember the Segway transporter. 
I certainly do because I was starting to save my, you know, my money to buy one. Uh, the Segway transporter, when it was uh, being talked about, remember it had this super secret code name Ginger and everybody thought, oh, Ginger is coming out. What is Ginger? We don't know. It's going to be amazing. So people had great expectations. The publicity was huge. It was, was on the cover of all the magazine. It had $180 million in funding from Planner Perkins. Right? So architects said, cities will be redesigned because everybody's going to go around in a Segway. Then it launched. Who do you see riding Segways? Mall cops and lazy tourists, <laughs> right? So you re remember my definition of success and failure? You know, expectations, everybody, you know, going around Paris and everything, everybody in this, results, mall cops and lazy tourists, right? This is what I call false negatives, uh, sorry, false positives. Everybody tells you, best idea ever, so you go, you build it, you invest, and then you launch it and nothing happens. How common are false positives? Incredibly common. In fact, I would say most of the products launch are false positives. Everything in the Google graveyard is a false positive. The Microsoft Morgue is a false positive. Amazon Ambulance is a false positive. Howard the Duck. Basically, every idea that you see a company full of competent people launching after doing what they think is good market research that fails, that is, by definition, a false positive. Right? They go up in flames. Why? Because of the law of market failure. And once again, the law is blind. If you don't have the right idea, there is nothing that you can do. So that's the first thing that can happen. The second horrible thing that happens in Totland is great ideas get killed. So you have an idea and everybody tells you, stupidest idea ever, right? So I don't know how you felt the first time you heard about Twitter. I thought, well, this must be the just about the stupidest idea ever. And a lot of other people thought the same, you know, 140 characters, anyone follows everybody, you know, it's kind of a stalker's dream. No, but it's just, it's not going to work. Well, as we know, uh, that is uh, an example of a false negative. You know, for better or worse, Twitter has changed the way that we communicate as a species. No, who'd have thunk it? So here's the challenge. You have an idea. You, you, know, you don't want to invest in it unless you know it's the right it. You cannot depend on people's opinion. What can you depend on? Data, yes, you said the, the magic number. That's the other expression we, that, you know, the pound into your head at Google. Data beats opinion. Data beats opinion. So, and people, people pretty much got this message, right? So, but when they come to me with ideas and I tell them, well, show me data that there is interest in your market, I see all kinds of horrors. Uh, because here's the thing, not all data is created equal, not all market data. There's two types of data. OPD and Yoda is the name I gave to them. OPD stands for other people's data. Sounds like OCD, right? So you know, if you have both OCD and OPD, better not to have it. Can you guess what Yoda stands for, your smart group? No. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> yes. It stands for your own data. Now, you've heard uh, apples and oranges. So uh, this is, to me, it's a perfect case of apples and oranges. In fact, OPD is rotten, stinking apples and Yoda, fresh, beautiful oranges, right? You want to have your own Yoda. Stay away from opinions and stay away from OPD. They're both uh, very dangerous. By the way, here's my definition of other people's data. You, you'll find out it includes pretty much everything. It's data collected by other people for other projects, in other from other times, in other places, with other techniques, so on and so forth, right? Just because somebody succeeded or failed with an idea similar to yours or in a market similar to yours doesn't mean that you will succeed or fail. Let's pick an example. All right, I have to go quickly through the, in the book I give much more explanation and justification for this, but allow me to go quickly. So here's an example. Imagine Elon Musk, right? He just sold his company to eBay uh, for what? And he collected $200 million. Most people would retire to Hawaii. He thought, well, I'm going to start it. An auto com a electric car company, you know, a space rocket company, and a solar uh, company. But he thought, well, okay, before I start this Tesla thing, let me see uh, what's, what happened. You know, my plan is, well, I'm, first I'm going to build a super sexy roadster. Uh, it's going to be expensive, but then I'm going to have an even more expensive uh, sedan, and then I'm going to bring the prices down. But let me see what, what has happened in the electric car market before me. Well, and basically, companies that really you know, that already were building cars failed miserably with electric cars, right? 
So if Elon Musk had gone and looked at OPD, he thought, well, maybe this is not a, such a good idea. I would have done uh, something else, right? And this idea would have gone up in flame. Just one example. And the opposite also works. You think, you think well, Apple succeeded with a smartphone. Google succeeded with a smartphone. We, Amazon, are going to succeed with a smartphone. Not so much, right? So this happens all the time. Stay away from OPD. You want to get your own data. Your own data is data gathered firsthand, locally, recently, rigorously, with skin in the game. I know it sounds like one, almost one of those fancy restaurants where you say all the ingredients are freshly picked from local growers. And that's actually a pretty good, pretty good description. Right? So you want to collect, the, you, you want to touch the data and see the people. And out of all these things, to me, the most important one is skin in the game. Skin in the game means that people must give you something much more than an opinion. They cannot just tell you, yes, if you build it, we will buy. You want to get them to give you the, either their money, their time, their commitment, their information, their reputation, something of value and at risk. Otherwise, you don't have data, uh, right? So let me give you an example. Susie has an idea for a smart hammer, right? It hits the nail and it doesn't hit your finger, right? So she, she goes and talks to some construction workers and ex explain the smart hammer. And uh, you know, one of them says, good idea. And the other one says, lame idea. Is this data? What is it? Opinion. Opinion. Perfect. Right? So does it count? <coughs> Not at all. Uh, now, she goes and talks to, you know, to another group. One person says, lame idea. Well, you know, if you watch Shark Tank, well, you're dead to me because you're not buying to me this idea. The other person gives them, hey, hey, here's $20. I want to be in the waiting list for the first uh, smart hammer that you create. Right? So this is data. This is an example of Yoda with skin in the game. And this is what you want to try uh, to get. And once again, since, so I explained this to students. I have some of my students here. Where, where are you? In the past. Oh, there. So I have at least one student. Remember, I was telling you about skin in the game and data. So people come and they bring data, but sometimes they bring data without actual skin in the game. So a new tool I created is called the skin in the game caliper. Because people usually cheat. You know, if you put some numbers into a spreadsheet, it can look like data. And if you make a nice chart out of it, it looks like even better data. So I told them, no, no, it doesn't count. This is my skin in the game caliper. Let's see. Data. Uh, you have skin in the game points. Opinions. How many points do you get of skin in the game for opinions? Zero. Zero. Good. Fake mail, email addresses or phone numbers? Zero. Zero. Comments on social media, views on YouTube, Twitter? No, still zero. I'm a tough grader. Yeah. Yeah. No, one, yeah, you could, uh, 0 0.01, maybe, ah. maybe, right? But I, I, I round it off to zero. So, uh, what about survey polls? Say, hey, you know, if I, buy, buy, if I build this, would you pay $5 or $10 or uh, $20? How many points? Zero. 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 <laughs> you're, you're getting the gist, right? So <laughs> say, hey, are we ever going to get any good numbers? What about a validated email address? One. Something where you, you yes, one. one. So yeah, but it has to be with the understanding, say, hey, Dan, if you give me your email address, I will send you some brochures and you know, market you. So you give me a piece of information. So I consider that the smallest amount of skin in the game you got something, you know, because you know you don't give your email address to anybody. Uh, what about a validated phone number? I already put the number, yeah. ten. Because I give my, excuse me. It says ten. It says ten. Yes, I know, I know. You you were gonna guess ten? No. What were you gonna guess? I was gonna give it a five. Five. Okay. Yeah. The beauty is you can create your own skin in the game caliper. No, different <laughs> products are different, uh, uh, different uh, values. For for example, if you sell caskets. Uh, you know, uh, people are probably more reluctant to give you their phone number because, uh, you know, it's bad luck. Uh, what about time commitment? You know, hey, we're giving a one hour presentation on uh, caskets, by how to buy the best casket. Three. Three? Well, actually, you know, time to me counts a lot. I give it, say, one point per minute. But see, the, the beauty of numbers, say, if we, you and I are doing a startup, we kind of decide what those numbers are, you know, and I usually do it in orders of magnitude, you know, kind of one, ten, or one hundred. What about the cash deposit? Say ten dollars a buck, right? So you, you can scale it. Don't don't yeah. Don't worry about three. Make it one, ten, or um, one hundred. So here this happens to me all the time. Somebody comes to me and said, Alberto, I have a great idea. I said, Well, don't. I'm not going to give you an opinion for an idea. Uh, you need to give me data. Say, Okay, wait, wait. We got data. 
and they show me something like this. So we made this YouTube video, we got uh, 12,000 views and a bunch of likes, and we did a survey and 88% of people told us they would buy the product. Zero skin in the game points. Now, am I a tough grader? Yes. Do you know why I'm a tough grader? Because you know who's tougher? The law of failure. Right? So, you know, just like in a court of law, you need the preponderance of the evidence, you know, to find somebody uh, guilty. When, when you know that most products fail, you have to have some pretty hard evidence that it succeeds. So, you know, it's better, make it, keep it simple, zero game, uh, zero game points. This was something I would consider, say, Team B creates a prototype, I will explain that in a second. They showed it to a target market, not a lot of people, could be 100 people in a very focused group, and six of them put down a $10 deposit, right? Now, that is skin in the game. So that's when I start to think, okay, this product actually may, may have uh, potential. So here's, and you can quote me on this, so if you wanna take a photo, here, I'll stand in front of it. <laughs> yes. Okay, she's bossing me around. You know. <laughs> There. <laughs> yeah, because I want you to remember this, you know, it's so easy to get people to open their mouth, yes, I would buy, so on and so forth. Opening the wallet is very hard. So the startup, the second startup I did that, that we failed, don't you think we did due diligence? You think VCs give you $25 million without due diligence? We did due diligence up the wazoo. You know, we had lists of people say, yes, we will buy one product for every engineer, $1,000 a, a year license, so on and so forth. Then when it came time to pay up, not so much. Right, so pe get people to open their, uh, their wallet. Yes? So do you think that Kickstarter model is actually a model that... Yeah, so ki Kickstarter, I'll answer, I'll answer this quickly, then we can go back. Kickstarter is great, it's awesome. What I teach you is uh, greater and awesomer, because here's the problem with Kickstarter, uh, which, by the way, I use, and there is a stage in your development where you probably want to use it. You do something on Kickstarter, problem number one, you let the whole world know about your idea. Right? So maybe you don't want that. Problem number two, you, it takes quite a while to produce something that looks good on Kickstarter. Problem number three, uh, maybe you do get 10,000 orders, then you're stuck delivering that. Right? So it's kind of a heavyweight thing. I think Kickstarter is awesome, but it's not the first thing that I would try ever. Uh, so uh, thank you, good question. So this is when people usually do market research, most of them, maybe not the people in this room, because we, we, we tend to be a bit more uh, advanced in our thinking here. If you've been coming to these groups and if you read Dan's book, you probably know that you cannot depend on opinion. But most people approach market research with this, hey, if I build it, will you buy it, right? So you have to flip this around. And this is how I flip it. If you buy it, we will build it. Now, once again, in Silicon Valley, this, this doesn't sound as controversial. You try to explain this to a German company, they say, no, we cannot possibly <laughs> sell something that we don't have, right? A terrible German accent. But pretty much outside of Silicon Valley, you look, they look at this and said, this is impossible, this is immoral, this should not be done. I said, well, it's, it's possible and it's, in fact, it's even more moral. Because think about it, what is, what is more moral? Uh, testing an idea to make sure that you're really building something that's worthwhile or spending five years and your most valuable resources, entrepreneurs, engineers, and build these things that nobody wants and you put in landfills. No, it's possible, it's moral, and I will explain you how to do it. Because then the problem comes, hey, but don't I have to have the product or service available before I collect Yoda, right? And the answer is no, you don't build it, right? You prototype it. How many people here have heard the word prototype before? How many people hate it? Yes, yes, okay, this is, so some people don't like it, that, that's okay, use your own word. But I created it for a very specific purpose. Because either when I was told to build a prototype, or I told my engineers to build a prototype, sometimes it would take six months, sometimes it would take a year. So I wanted the word that indicates, look, no, a prototype, you must be done in it in about two weeks maximum, usually these days I give it two days or two hours, and it must produce Yoda. Because you know what? A prototype usually is built to prove that you can build it and I know that you can build it. What I don't know if you should build, whether you should build it or not. So how did I come up with prototyping? My first uh, run into it, 
happen by accident. So I was at Google in the early day. I'm kind of changing some of the details because maybe it's confidential information. But let's say that at the beginning where we were launching AdWords and Google was very small. So my team of less than 20 people, we had to test AdWords. And how do you do it you know, in, in a live situation? So because we don't want to actually advertise real products. So we had a lot of fun coming up with products that nobody would ever search for, let alone buy. And my example is the Michael Bolton Barbie doll. <laughs> because, because we figure, look, nobody's ever going to go on Google and type Michael Bolton Barbie doll. And even if they do, they're not going to buy it. So we thought we created a little corner of the internet where our data would be uncontaminated. Right? So we could do our little experiments uh, with AdWords. Well, you can imagine, if you do enough of these experiments, what do you think you, you can see in the logs after a while? Yeah, some people somehow arrived and, well, Michael Bolton, Barbie doll, doll, uh, Barbie doll looks good, click, right? Uh, and when, of course, when they click it, is that Yoda? Yeah, well, yeah, it sure is. You know, if you buy and you think it's $19, you know, that's kind of, they're getting ready uh, to buy. So, yes, that actually is Yoda. Who said no? Why is it not Yoda? Yeah, yeah, but they, they were going to our buy, right? Yeah, you, they press buy, but you have to transact. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Good. Complete and then you're done. And the, then you're done. That's good, right? So but at that time, since this product didn't exist, but this is more than somebody telling you I would buy or I would not buy. So basically, this made me realize, said, hmm, I can test if an idea, people would buy an idea without actually building something. But in the back of my mind, I felt pretty bad for the people that actually wanted the Michael Bolton Barbie doll. <laughs> so uh, whenever you use a prototype of this type, uh, I'll tell you what to do so you don't feel bad, right? Because prototyping is ethical and truly is a win-win-win. Nobody, nobody gets disappointed. So I thought, well, are there more of these techniques? Techniques where, you know, I can find out if an idea is the right it with a minimum of effort. So I started to search and I collected many of them. Uh, this is a, a cheat, cheat from a, a Stanford class I taught that has some of the techniques and I will go, and they're all covered in the books, uh, in the book, and I will go through some of them. So this is called the fake door for obvious reason, right? Because you knock and it's not there. By the way, you could do this also in the real world. You know, it can be brick and mortar. For those of you that don't want to do the fake door, and for some products you shouldn't do it, like for a medical product, say, if you suffer from this terrible disease, we now have a medicine. Oh, finally I will be cured. Ah, sorry, the product doesn't exist. So, no, use your sense of ethics. There is another technique that's very similar, it's called the facade. So the facade, uh, a good example, this was Cars Direct. At the beginning of the internet, Bill Gross wanted to know, would people buy used cars online? I mean, those were the days where they didn't want to put the, the business card, uh, their, their credit card online. So what did he did do? He created a website, he had no cars in inventory, but he knew he could buy you know, cars from a used lot car dealer. So he put a big uh, uh, ad in the paper, advertising the website. The first two days, he sold four cars. So he immediately shut down the website, bought four cars at retail, sold them at retail. So he lost a few hundred dollars on each car. But what did he gain? Yoda, Yoda right? I mean, imagine this. Hey, I have a business plan. I think people will buy used cars online. It has all the fancy hockey stick graph. Uh, compare that, you know, 30 page plan versus, hey, this idea, this is a website and you staple four checks from people that actually bought the car. Right? That's how you actually make uh, the case. Zappos did the same with shoes. Uh, another prototyping technique is the mechanical Turk, right? There's a lot of talk about uh, machine learning and uh, you know, AI these days. But you know, before you invest to build the AI, you can use a human being to do the function, either the AI or the robot, right? This technique is named after the mechanical Turk, which people pretend it was a chess playing machine, but they actually had a small chess player inside. So let's say you invent some new kind of automated teller machine that does, I don't know uh, <laughs> what. Before you work out all the hardware and the software, you know, just uh, you know, get one of your smaller employees to fit in there and say, hey, Bob, we'll buy you pizza afterwards. You know, see if people actually uh, transact uh, uh, to this. IBM did a, a beautiful like, experiment with, with this. In the early days, they wanted to know if people would want to use speech to text. Uh, and you know, if you try to go back 30 years ago, we didn't know how to type, you know, most people type like this. Unless you were a programmer, a writer, or an administrator, or secretary, you didn't know how to type. So they thought, there's no way personal computers would take off until we have 
speech to text. But before they invested billions of dollars to build a prototype, which in those days they couldn't even build, right? Because the computers were not fast enough. They did a very clever experiment. They brought people in the room, they gave them a microphone and a screen, no keyboard, and told them, look, we have a speech to text uh, uh, tool. You just dictate it, t t tell you to do what you want, and it will do it for you. So we say, okay, uh, take letter, dear Mr. Jones, yada, yada, yada. They did that, and the text magically appeared on the screen. They couldn't have built a prototype, you know, uh, because the technology was not there. What did they do? In the room next door, you know, wired with a microphone, we had one of those people who really <laughs> types amazingly fast, pretending playing, uh, playing computer, right? So this is an example of a mechanical uh, Turk. And so right now, if you want to do an application that uses, say, uh, Google Voice Assistants of Amazon Alexa to, I don't know, give, I don't know, uh, uh, dating advice. No, you could build all the fancy stuff or you could just have somebody there kind of listening and giving the answer before uh, you build it. So this is another prototyping uh, technique. By the way, what IBM learned there is that people thought they would like the idea of speech to text, but if you ever try to speak to a computer all day, your throat gets sore, Every, the room is very loud and then you cannot dictate confidential things like fire Bob. Oh, sorry Bob, didn't know you were in the room. <laughs> right, so there's a lot of problems with that. In Thoughtland it sounded like a great idea. When they tried to get POs based on the experiments, it failed. Uh, another one of my favorite techniques is they call the infiltrator prototype. Uh, this company in San Francisco, they invented a little product called the Wall Hub, piece of plastic where you hang your keys uh, and your mail as you leave the door. They wanted to know, would people buy this? So they, they 3D printed uh, a dozen of them and did something very clever. First they went on eBay and they bought an IKEA employee t-shirt. Shirt. So they could impersonate <laughs> IKEA employees. Then they created uh, some fake IKEA uh, product tag. Of course they had to change the name because <laughs> Wallhub is not IKEA, so they call it the Val Hoop. Right? <laughs> and um, so then instead of, instead of shoplifting, they entered the store with a big blue bag and while nobody was looking around, they put <laughs> the Val Hoop, uh, you know, in various parts of the store and they filmed the whole thing. In fact, if you click on the link, you could see the video that they took, which is hilarious. Now, so they were, you know, they counted 100 people go and look at the Val Hoop. They counted uh, what happens, how many people actually went to the cashier. And the cashiers were kind of things fell apart because, of course, the, the, the QR code did not scan. So people uh, didn't know what to do it. They were allowed to take the Val Hoop at home. Right? So this is one of nice things for prototyping. You want to be generous with, with people. Instead of spending money doing a focus group you know, and feeding them you know, for fancy shrimps and stuff and, and paying them, at the end they said, look, this product actually is not ready, but go and take it home. So they're very happy. IKEA, I don't know exactly what happened to IKEA, so make sure you ask permission if you do this. <laughs> if you're arrested, don't come back to me, but this is a cool <laughs> technique. And you would agree that somebody walking with a Valhub in their cart that's Yoda, right? That's not speculation. Uh, okay, a couple more. One night stand. Uh, was Airbnb started by financial geniuses with Harvard MBAs and $20 million in the bank? No. It was started by a couple of guys who couldn't pay their rent in San Francisco. Uh, and that is the idea of uh, renting couches for couch surfing. So uh, they, they just put an ad, I think it was on, on Craigslist. And the first night, three people signed up to spend the night uh, you know, with two other strangers in a room, which is how many horror movies start. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's their first piece of Yoda. And the reason I put these infographics here is because I want you to remember that the, the slogan is make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. Right? So just knowing that it's the right it, Airbnb had to do a lot of things right, right? And it evolved from couch surfing to actually renting whole houses. But at first they were able to prove their concept this way. All right. Impersonator, we talked before about second de sushi, I use this because food examples are the ones that people like uh, the best. So this started as a discussion between Stanford students who thought there is a market for sushi that's just about to go bad, but you know, still will not kill you if you eat it you know, within the next uh, uh, 24 hours. So some, some students thought it's a good idea, bad idea. I was in the room, I said, you need data, not opinions. So we decided to uh, prototype it. And because I do this with my students, I tell them, I give you two hours and less than $20. How would you prototype it? Good, yeah, you could buy sushi, but if you wanna, even if you wanna spend, if you give you zero dollars, you have zero budget. Maybe just to send off. Tomorrow I'm going to give you $20, like 
you could do you you could do that. Yes. So there are good. You got many prototyping te techniques. The one the students went with, they had some labels. They went to Kupa Cafe in Stanford, right? And that's like I don't know, ten boxes of sushi, and they labeled half the boxes said second the sushi, half off. So they didn't even have to buy the sushi, right? Uh, so now, of course, be very careful. You know, as you do this, you know, kind of ask for permission. But in terms of getting data, you know, this was a pretty good thing. Now, do you think anybody bought the second day sushi? No. No, I thought, yes, I thought they would. Uh, in fact, we said, okay, this experiment failed, right? You don't just make decisions based on one experiment. So we tried more experiments. We tried to sell it directly. We, we actually said, hey, I promise this won't kill you. Look, I'm eating a piece myself. Uh, somehow people just didn't want it. Uh, we made a little video, but here's the point. We were talking about this idea at around 10 or 11 a.m. By 1 p.m. we had Yoda. Now, one experiment, of course, is not conclusive, right? But it starts to give you your first piece of data before you go and write you know, your business plan for your, uh, uh, for your MBA. Now, this, remember the XYZ hypothesis? What we did with secondary sushi is something I called hypozooming, another one of the techniques I described in the book. Now, your XYZ hypothesis is a big that hypothesis, right? Remember it said, uh, the, the one that we had for, uh, uh, sorry, I just clicked the wrong slide. The one we had was 20% 20 uh, 20 of people who buy packaged sushi will buy secondary sushi if it's half the price, right? So that's a, that's a big thing. So the technique of hypozooming is to take the big general hypothesis, uppercase XYZ, Move it to a baby hypothesis, something that you can test very, very quickly. And the name comes from, uh, have you ever see, seen those documentaries or those video shots where you start from outer space and then you see the Earth and then the planet and then it comes down to a guy holding a cup of coffee? That's what I want you to do with your idea, right? Your goal may be to sell secondary sushi you know, in, all, uh, in, uh, in all of America. Uh, zoom in, because right now you're not everywhere, so ask the student, where are you? Well, we're in Silicon Valley. Zoom in. We're in Silicon Valley. We're at Stanford. We're at Stanford. Building Y2E2. Right? So you went down to the building. Is there a place that sells sushi in building Y2E2? Yes. Right? So get your data here. You know, that allows you to get your time to data uh, uh, very, very quickly. So the hypo zoom to this uh, hypothesis. 20% uh, of Stanford students buy lunch at Coupa Cafe today will buy it if it's up the price. And it just pretty much failed, uh, failed miserably. So if, if the big hypothesis is true, you must be able to do experiments and those experiments must confirm it. Otherwise, you have a very hard time uh, making your case. And by the way, you can apply this to big things, right? One of my favorite examples of the impersonator prototype. Impersonator because you take a product, fresh sushi, and you pretend it's stale sushi. But you're not, you haven't built anything. You just scribble some labels. Elon Musk did this with the original Tesla Roadster. So this was his vision. All right, so pretend it's like 15 years ago and I come to you and say, hey guys, I have an idea here. It's a $120,000 all-electric car, a two-seater. I've never built a car company before, but what do you think? <laughs> no, so, oh, come on, Elon, nobody has succeeded with electric cars. You've never built a car company. I mean, you barely got this PayPal thing. It's all kind of software stuff. It's not your thing. So what did he do? First of all, he, he bought a Lotus Elise, removed the internal combustion engine, put an electric engine, put his own little body, and then he went and gave people rides in this car. So zero to 60 in like three seconds. So let's pretend I gave the four of you a ride. Hi. Hi. Hi, so I, I gave you a ride in my super hot uh, zero to 60 car. Did you like it? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so everybody, everybody likes, right? It's a prototype, so so far, Thought land thumbs up. Said, well, okay, here's the thing. It's gonna cost $120,000. You need to put a big charger in the garage. And since, you know, eventually we'll have charging stations, but right now I don't, so you can only go 50 miles and then come back. Uh, do you think you'll buy one? No, thank you. Not definitely. Say yes, just so we have kind of variety, <laughs> right? Of course. Yeah, of course, most people said no, but I need, I need so, so the three of you are dead to me, right? <laughs> no, but have you given me any skin in the game so far? No. Right, so, so far it's all thought life. So, look, uh, what is your name? Philip. Philip, so Philip, it's not that I don't trust you, but I've listened to Alberta and he said I must get some skin in the game. So here's the deal. Uh, if you're really serious about this, right? Say yes, sure. right? So otherwise it will be here for <laughs> yeah. Okay, now to be sure that you really want to buy it, I'm gonna ask you to give me a $5,000 deposit today. And in about two years, 
you're number 30 on the list, you may get your car. Now, think about it. Is it easier to say that yes or to write a check for $5,000 to a guy that has never built a car <laughs> company yes, before? Yes. Right? There's no question. And yet, Elon Musk was able to get several checks for uh, $5,000, including from, uh, from Larry and Sergey. That's not Larry's real signature because he doesn't put little hearts over it. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure you don't steal the check. So you, you would argue this is as good as Yoda is. Uh, so I'm often wondering, why doesn't everybody do it this way, right? How, how are most cars designed? Well, they're designed in Thotland, right, without skin in the game. So here's my favorite example. Remember the Pontiac Aztec, right? Product managers here. So I, I wasn't there, you know, so I don't know exactly what has happened, but I have a pretty good idea of what happened. Marketing group said, you know, we need to sell more minivans. And, uh, but there's a problem. Men don't like to drive minivans because they don't think they're macho enough. <laughs> so I guess uh, I have an idea. What if we make a really macho minivan, right? Four-wheel drive, a built-in tent, and all of these things. And so, uh, and no, we call it the Aztec. This is really, you know, kind of uh, macho people said, yeah, of course, why can it, uh, how could it fail? So they bring it to the car shows. They put it on a, you know, one of those rotating things and ask, uh, sir, you with a beard, you look like a macho guy. How, how many kids do you have? Three, four. Four, okay, yeah, big now. So you probably need a large car like a minivan, but how does a macho guy like you feel driving a minivan? Not very good. Not very macho. But what about the Aztec? So you, you see how the story goes. So somehow in Thotland, people think, yeah, yeah, it makes, makes sense. It has a space and yet it's macho enough. So yeah, it, this cannot fail. And then, of course, the most famous example of the Aztec is driven by Walter White in the show Breaking Bad. So that's what happens if you depend on opinion and uh, data with no skin in the game. All right, so remember, if we build it, if, if you buy it, we will build it. Uh, you have to, you know, sometimes it's hard, but these prototyping techniques make it easier. Now, I like to do, uh, to just make sure you got the point on, I want to do a live exercise for you. So I'm going to give you a, a product and we're going to prototype it together. Now, the product I pick is Max Spaghetti. <laughs> which, as an Italian, really offends me because it's an overcooked pasta in a styrofoam container with a ketchup sauce. But, you know, that, that is what, that is my opinion, right? R see, this is how, uh, disgusting, it's subjective, you know, I have all my Italian background. So let's assume that I run a McDonald's and one of you comes up with the idea for Max Spaghetti and I said, well, I hate it, but, you know, let's get some data. I don't think anybody would die, uh, would buy it. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, First thing, we write an XYZ hypothesis. You know, to be in the McDonald's menu, at least say 5% of the people have to order it at 199. Uh, then uh, we want to hypozoom it. How would you hypozoom it? Let's, let's pretend this is real. I own a McDonald's, you're one of my employees, and by this time tomorrow, I want actual data. How would you hypozoom? Put, put it on the menu board. Just on the menu. You don't hurt any pasta. Okay, good. So now your penalty for answering correctly, you'll have to come and wear the McDonald's hat. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, because we're going to do a little play acting here, okay? Because I want to drive the home the pont to prototype. So, s welcome, you're my employee. Yeah, you have a big head. There you go. So stand here. Pretend this is the McDonald's counter. Okay. We're, actually, we're doing Oh, no, no, stand here. Okay. This oh, looks okay. like a McDonald's counter. <laughs> So if I start, take photos, you know, embarrass him online, yes. Yeah, <laughs> He's <good>. been demoted. <laughs> <laughs> so his idea is just put it on the menu, Notice, which I love because you're not cooking any pasta. You're doing it in one restaurant, it's on the menu. Uh, right. Now, so I make a deal with you. I said, look, I, I want to get, I want to get data. So I say, D Dave, uh, let's do a deal. The next hundred people that come at lunch tomorrow, whatever they order you ask them, wouldn't you rather have Max Spaghetti instead? <laughs> Then I'll just start with this, Let, let's play it out. So I come in and said, yes, I'd like a, a Big Mac, French fries, and a Coke, please. Would you like to consider Max Spaghetti instead? Oh, that actually sounds good. Yes, why not? Uh, what happens now? <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very well done. Okay, no, so you, he doesn't have to leave. So first, uh, no, seriously, that was very funny, but uh, <laughs> w w w what could you do that the customer actually feels happy? No, 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 no. Even I before mean, you would do the spaghetti. Yeah, you run out of spaghetti and you offer something for free. Yeah. Yeah, or you don't even. So 
you don't have to lie. I said, look, yeah. actually, this is part of the marketing research. I'm sorry it's not available now. So but Big Mac or whatever. give them a full meal. Yeah, yeah, right. Look, <laughs> you, you know how much McDonald's spends in market research. You know, you're, you're giving them $2 worth of food. So you give, them a, a, you give them the full meal. So we do this for 100 people. Now, notice what has happened. First of all, would you say that the person willing to pay $2 is that Yoda? Yeah, yeah. That's as good as it is, you know, your, your target market. Uh, would you, th the only part that you think, well, do you feel that I was strict as a customer a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, good. So it means you have, you have a decent sense of, uh, you know, you have a decent moral compass, but uh, unfortunately it's pointing in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? So it's good that you have a compass. This is why, first of all, uh, I think we can all agree that the biggest waste if smart people building stuff that the world doesn't need. Can we agree on this? Yeah. Right? If you've all failed, you know, that's, that's the biggest failure. So think about, in this particular case, what is my inconvenience? I came in wanting a Big Mac. I spent five seconds thinking, okay, I'll have Mac spaghetti, and it doesn't exist, and I get a meal for free. Do I win? Yeah. yeah. I win. Does he, as an employee that came up with this idea, win because he's allowed to express his innovation? Yeah. Yes. Do I, as a manager, have I collected real data that this idea could have been the real lead? Yeah. Right. Win, win, win. Right. You don't you know. Th this sounds a little tricky, but l let's think about it. When you ask the market, w if I build it, will you buy it? And they say yes. In a sense, the market is lying to you. And it's a big lie because it launches you in this multi-year, million dollars things. So find out, not with lie, just what this little experiment. And then you can fess up. Say, Oh, look, I'm sorry, this is an experiment. We just wanted to know if people would order Max Spaghetti. Here's a free meal. People don't get upset. Thank you, Dave. Sure. You're welcome. A big round of applause for Dave. <laughs> All right, so Yoda in two hours. Now, think about the beauty. First of all, notice I told him, look, pick a hundred people, right? Uh, I was talking to the gentleman before, he's, you know, he said an idea for an app, and he said, well, how, how do I run out? I don't want to spoil my market. He said, well, as long as you're focusing on the target group, you can only use 100 people, right? Statistics, if you remember your statistics uh, in, uh, you know, from, uh, from college, 100 people of your, with a proper sample size, it starts to be statistically uh, significant. So compared to uh, Kickstarter, you let the whole world know, right? This way you just let 100 people, uh, 100 people know, so you don't let everybody know, which means you contain your risk, you don't even have to use your own brand, and yet you get useful data. Now, you don't make a big decision based on one experiment, you know, maybe you build it up, maybe the next, after you confirm this, you actually cook some pasta to make sure that people will actually come back for it uh, again, which interest creates, you know, an interesting uh, uh, challenge. Let's say that people bought it first, so you actually cook it now, uh, you want to know if they would order it again, uh, how would you get that information now? So you've, you've eaten Max Spaghetti, and uh, if I come and ask you, did you like it? Say, say yes. yes. Yeah. Would you order it again? I don't know. No, say yes just for the <laughs> sample <laughs> form. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is it skin in the game? No. no right. Could, he could be lying. How can I get some skin in the game that he really meant Prepay it? Prepare for the next one. Yeah. The Prepare discount, said. The That's right. Price for the next Here. If you really like it, here's some coupons. You know, 10 coupons and you just pay 50 cents instead of $2. Now, if you buy the coupons, that is actual skin uh, in the game, right? So uh, lots, uh, lots of advantages. In this case, results less than expectation, but believe it or not, Max Spaghetti is popular in some parts of Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. So uh, yes, uh, and which proves, you know, you have to make sure, that's why I say, you tell you, test locally. Right, you never know when an idea is actually going to succeed. Okay, I'll give you another example. Uh, so I, I was working with this uh, company, L'Oreal, and they were, you know, I, I thought, well, how about innovating using artificial intelligence? So I came up with this really cool device. Uh, first, I came up with the best slogan ever, artificial intelligence to bring out your natural beauty, <laughs> which I don't know what I haven't used because I think it's fantastic, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, so I thought, here's the idea, okay. Uh, you have a website, yeah, there's a copyright there, so don't steal it now. You have a website, so uh, a person uploads a photo, right? So, you uh, know, my wife goes in, uploads her photo. <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? Okay, I don't know. Yeah, my wife laughed too, I thought it was pretty funny. But, so, they, they put the photo, and then they say, well, help me choose a lipstick. So, they click lipstick analysis, 
and uh, then you know they're super uh, smart uh, algorithm analyzes and then it says you know doing based on color skins and hair color kind of gives uh, an analysis and then shows you know the hottest look whatever is that one and puts a buy now button right so this is just an idea I was just playing around with ideas what you could do with the AI and beauty now do you think that it can be built yeah. any question no, right? So zero risk building. Where is the risk? Would people actually use it? More specifically, will people upload their photos and buy the recommended lipstick? Let's say it costs a million dollars to develop. Right. Let's prototype it. Any ideas? Simplest possible prototype. I give you 24 hours and a web designer. How would you prototype it? Upload a picture and then have a person just look at it and then real Okay, that's, it, that's even fancier. You know, for the first one, you could do a really, I mean, that's good, yeah. Uh, if your web designer is really quick, you could do that. For the first one, yeah, you could just uh, upload it and then say, sorry, the algorithm is not working. Uh, but if you give us your email address, we'll let you know when it's actually up. It's just an experiment. In the meantime, send us your email address and, uh, you know, your address and we'll send you a box of, you know, $40 of cosmetics. Right? Do you agree? Everybody would be happy yeah, and you get uh, real data. Right? So you collect your data, you say, look, uh, at the 100 clicks, under view, 64 clicks, 42 emails. Now you want to go to the next level. Then you could do what you designed, the, described, which is a mechanical Turk uh, uh, prototype, right? So you could actually have somebody who's an expert in skin tone, and you know they look at the photo, and then they, they can actually recommend the thing without building the, the algorithm. And again, you get your data. So if you do enough of this experiment, you, and you go back and say, look, this is going to cost a million dollars and require some fancy AI, but we know that people would actually use it. Because, you know, 21% of the time people actually buy the recommended lipstick and they really like the idea. So this is um, another example. Uh, so was it the right it? Yes, use a Yoda to get decision. Let's do a, a last one and then I'll wrap up and we can have some questions. Uh, another a company gave a presentation to Scalog. You know, I don't eat breakfast or lunch, just a hell of a big dinner usually. And, but I like cereal, but I like to eat them at night. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there is a cereal, a cereal that has like the right ingredients, I don't know, melatonin and stuff that helps me sleep. So I came up with this idea, Kellogg Special Z's, right? Uh, so uh, how would you, how many of you think it's a good idea? Okay, yeah, uh, many of you probably eat cereals at night. So look, yeah, the higher day you're wired, this would, yeah, so unfortunately just stop land, right? So here's the first prototype I did. Uh, I mocked up, I took a box of uh, regular cereal, and then I put a, you know, I created my little special Z box, and I, I asked my wife, uh, that's my wife in the photo, but that's not me, so I don't know what's going on there, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> no. We have, um, so I asked, hey, look, there's this new cereal, you know, it, it helps you sleep. I said, are you interested? And she said, no, stupid idea. Okay, all right. So just one data point, not a big deal, but it's a good experiment. So I, I went, same experiment. Uh, but by the way, here, you, know, you notice that I have some metrics that I talk about in the book that are pretty uh, important. Time to data, dollar to data, distance to data, right? Uh, or Yoda, uh, in this case. You want to come up with your Yoda as quickly as possible. That's why you do it locally. So I thought, okay, this is one, was one experiment. Let me do another one. Uh, I still use the same box that I created, and then I can infiltrate a Safeway store, and they go in the sleep aid section, right? And right under all the NyQuil and, the, and all the stuff, I can put the box there, or I can put it in the cereal section, and then I can find out if people actually pick it up. Once again, if you do this with permissions, you know, you get into much less uh, trouble. Once again, if I pick a Safeway close to my house, my time to data, my distance to data, my dollar to data is very small. And would you agree that if people pick it up and try to buy it, you know, it means that they're, uh, they're interested and they would want it. And of course, I could do the same thing online, right? I can get the website, kelloggspecialz.com, create the ad campaign and get all my data. Um, and of course, what happens to the people that, you know, try to buy it? Yeah, give them a gift, you know, an Amazon gift card, the free box of cereals, right? And tell them, look, I'm just doing a, a, an experiment, I'm collecting data. They, they feel good. I tell you, I do this all the time. If you're nice to them, they're not going to feel, uh, uh, feel bad. 
So we do all of these things, why? Because you want to fail fast and fail cheap. Everybody talks about failing fast. And then when they come to me and they told, tell me their plan, I tell them, that's not really fast. You want to fail Ferrari fast and Fiat cheap. <laughs> that's okay. Ferrari fast and Fiat cheap. So you want to fail very, very quickly and very, very cheaply. Why? Because if you want to succeed, you cannot spend millions and months and weeks to come up with, uh, with your ideas. You need to test them very quickly because most ideas fail. So you need to test a lot of ideas before you find the ones that work. And that's what prototyping allows you to do, right? Don't spend a, a lot of money on it. So is there more? Yes, you think, you know, my work of 10 years can be summarized in 60 minutes? No, not so. So that's why I wrote a full book, uh, a full book about it, which talks at length about it. But before we conclude and ask for some questions, people always ask me, hey, Alberto, do you practice what I, preach? Pre what I preach? Yes, of course. I, I practice it for one simple reason, because it works. Even better, it cannot not work, right? So these are putting an idea from fuzz gland into an XYZ hypothesis. Does anybody think that's a stupid idea? No, right. And to test the idea on a smaller scale with a statistically significant number, uh, with getting skin in the game. Is that a stupid idea? No, this, this is just very logical stuff. You know, I'm an engineer, so I, I couldn't tell you anything if I couldn't connect the dots in a logical way. I teach it because it works. And the best example of me practicing what I preach is my book, right? So in case you haven't done it yourself, writing a book is a real pain in the ass and it takes forever to do it. Now, do you know what happens to most books? Do they succeed in the market? No. Right? So I thought, well, I don't want to write a book that then I write it and nobody decides to publish or, or buy it. So what did I do? I wrote a little booklet. I gave myself a week. I called it Pretotype It. How many of you have read it or seen it? Good. Uh, so uh, it, since I put it out, it's been translated in about a dozen languages by volunteers. Some of them didn't even ask. Right? One day I said, hey, here's a Turkish translation of Pretotype It. I said, well, excellent. Right? Uh, <laughs> So once I knew that there was demand, you know, and I kept getting 10 emails per day of people, I read the book, write a proper book, I decided to build a prototype. So I actually wrote a first draft. This took several months. So I went from several days, from uh, several months. And guess what? Because the publisher knew that people were interested in the prototype. I just showed them, look, I even put it for sale on Amazon, right? And I, and I sold uh, uh, several of them. They knew that, I mean, several, several hundreds or thousands of that, they knew that there was demand for it. So I had my own data. And so it kind of made everything uh, pretty smooth. So yes, I practice what I preach. Uh, so with that, I thank you. And in fact, one of the raffle gifts today, hold on, will be an original copy of my prototype booklet. This was stapled with actual Google staple on actual Google paper. <laughs> and. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in a plastic bag, protected. So it's very valuable. The other copies, it's in the Smithsonian. No, that's not true. But one day, maybe. All right. So with that, I thank you. And then we have time for some Q&A. Thank you. All right. So I didn't, the way this works is you have to have a mic to ask a question. So we'll, you don't pick people. We'll just have, we'll pick the people. We'll give out the mics for you, Alberto. OK, here we go. Move it. Yeah, sure. Who's got a question? All right, we got one there. Great presentation, Alberto. Thank you. Uh, the question I have, based on an early slide, is what are your expectations for the book? Mm. Good question. So my first expectation was, if I write it, will I have a publisher? And will the publisher give me a big enough advance to justify me writing the book? Right. So you have to think, whenever you do something like a book or a movie, you have to think there are different expectations. So my personal expectation is that, if I write it, I get it in advance and I get the pleasure to see my book in print. And hopefully it becomes a bestseller, you know, who knows, stuff happens. The publisher, of course, has their own expectations, right? So you have to be very clear. So movies can be a, a commercial success, uh, a failure, but, you know, a critical success. So it's very clear to be about my expectations. My expectations was I'm going to spend this time to write it and I'm going to get a nice advance and it's going to be published properly by first-rate publishers. So, so far I'm happy. And of course, if it sells a lot, uh, you know, and I make much more than my advance, I'm going to be even happier. So bu please buy one. So I'll help you make the numbers. <laughs> Next question. Right here. Uh, hey, oh, uh, hi. Yeah, hey. 
So excellent presentation. I mean, I think the concept is amazing. Uh, excellent work. Um, so now, you know, let's say you pre-type a, a product and you market it and you get some really good traction off it, right? But you, it's a technological advanced yeah. product, right? And you don't have the back end for it. What would you do in a situation, let's say an enterprise company wants to implement it? Do you just scrounge up whatever type of advance or? Well, here, here's the point. If, if you, all you have is an idea and a business plan, you could get funding. In fact, you may be, if you're good at uh, you know, doing slides, you can get funding. I mean, it happened to me. I'm pretty good at giving presentations. But then you get, in fact, when I, I was so happy when I got funding for my second startup. However, uh, you know, th that was both the best day and the worst day of my career because yes, I raised $25 million, but I spent five years working on a product that doesn't work. So nobody gains if you get invested in the wrong idea. So, but if you have the data, if you have said, look, this idea works, here's Yoda, people would actually buy it. You can make your case with the investors much more clearly, more convincingly, but more importantly, you will know that even if you get the money, even if you get them because you're very good at making business plan or presentation, that if you build the idea, it will work because you suffer more, right? AVC, AVC, let's say, invest in 20 companies a year, right? Most of them will fail, but you know, all it takes is a, is a, is a Google you know, or an Intuit and they're, they're doing fine. But the entrepreneurs that get the money, they're, they're, they only have one bet, right? The VCs make 20 bets, so you only have one bet. So as an entrepreneur, it's very important that you make the right bet. So do not take the money unless you know that the idea is the right it because you're going to get the money, but then you're going to fail and you're going to suffer more than the VC. Mm. So give a round of funding but make wise decisions. Use it if the data supports. Remember, remember in, in a court of, court of law, you're innocent until proven guilty. In the court of the, the law of market failure, you need overwhelming evidence to balance the fact, right? That, you're, uh, that you think your idea is going to succeed, whereas most of them fail. And, and in the book, I have something I call it the right it meter that allows you to quantify and measure when you're ready to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for your talk. It's super helpful. Thank um, you. Yeah, so one, one question I had was regarding the role of like you, you, platforms like usertesting.com. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how would you? use that platform in a way and that allows you to fit this prototyping concept in. And the other question I have is about scale. So if you want to launch a, a web product or an app, like how do you prototype at scale in a cost efficient way? Well, okay. So f first let's answer the, the question. Prototyping, uh, how would I use something like user testing? Uh, I would use the same principle. You, there are other prototypes that I haven't mentioned because you know, we have limited time. You could do a YouTube video. There are many tools you could do. The point is this. Do not just collect opinions. Try to collect some skin in the game because otherwise, you know, zero points. So you can use whatever service you want, but if you can get information like email addresses or commitments, uh, but ideally money. You know, to me, there's nothing that speaks as clearly as people willing to give you money for your idea if it is a commercial idea. Right? If somebody's investing in you and it's a commercial idea, get money. If you're planning to make an artistic movie or the documentary you know, for a non-profit organization, then you have different criteria. But if your goal is to, to have people buy, nothing would convince you or an investor as money. As far as scale, uh, first, do the experiment. You know, nobody starts at scale, right? Google started inside Stanford, just, just indexing the Stanford document. Facebook star started inside, uh, in, inside Harvard. Nobody starts with 100 million users. So you always start small and you scale if you have the product that's right it. Don't worry, the market will guide you. One of the expressions I use is, if there's a market, there's a way. Now, it can happen, but I very rarely see it. I imagine VCs give you money, $3 million, your idea is going like gangbusters, but somehow you spent too much on the sushi free sushi lunches and then you run out of money. Do you think the VCs are going to pull the rug from you? Well, our startup failed because we ran out of money. That doesn't really happen. If you have huge traction, they're going to pump in more money. So if there's a market, there's a way. If there's no market, there's no way. Yes, there's a question there. Oh, yeah. Um, so you sp a lot of the examples you gave were kind of direct to consumer, yeah. um, where you know people can just give some money. Um, I, I'm sure you can do it in the enterprise space, but I'm actually even more specifically like, what about like, pharmaceuticals or a biotech yeah. company and you need to show clinical data um, to even get interest. 
but to, to get that clinical data you need like you could tell people that uh, this is this is what's the future and they'll be like yeah i'll buy it but that's the bad kind of data right the, that's right so there first of all you're talking about enterprise or b2b even in b2b at some point there is a customer right there's b2b2b B2B, and eventually there is a customer or a user even if I sell this big heavyweight application, I don't know, Oracle Enterprise, and I need to des- decide, do I want this app? Do I want the, the 4D rotating uh, vis- virtual reality graphs? At some point, you're going to have users there. So get together with whoever makes the decision and see if the users would actually want uh, that feature. Right? So even any B2B, at some point, there has to be a C or a U, or, or a C of a user. As far as pharmaceutical, yes, you have to be careful. Right? You don't want to say, Hey, you know, you have that problem with your ear itch, I have the medicine for you. So, sorry, I'm just prototyping. So you have to be very careful with that. But in fact, in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of my most, you know, thing that made me the happiest, there was my previous booklet, Prototyping, is mentioned as, uh, you know, one of the sources because in medicine uh, and pharmaceutical, you also need to do prototyping, right? A lot of techniques and tools actually do not find uh, a market, but you have to be a little bit more careful about the ethics. Um, hi, Alberto. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Like, I remember I went to a talk given by uh, the managing partner of uh, Sequoia Capital, uh, mm-hmm. Doug Leon. He's also from Italy. I love Italian. <laughs> and uh, he once mentioned that he would like to invest in ideas that has an uh, undiscovered market. Yeah. So if like you, do, you don't even know what exactly the market is, how can you prototype it? Okay, so good question. First of all, I'll say I love Doug Leone too, not because he's in Italian, because he's actually the one that invested. He was the lead investor in my $25 startup that didn't work. <laughs> all right? So, uh, and that's the startup that made me realize, yes, the market is undiscovered, but, uh, you, know, you know, if you go down the Amazon jungle, you know, you may discover some things that you don't, uh, you don't like. Also, remember this. The VCs play a different game than you do, right? VCs, they, you know, I make a little bet on each of you. I know that most of you will fail, but the ones of you that are going to succeed, hey, you're the lucky ones, right? You're, you're going to make up for it. So you, he may want to test an undiscovered market, of course, because he just puts money, right? And he has a lot of money, right? They have billions of dollars. But you're putting more skin in the game than, uh, than the VCs. So yeah, keep that in mind. Do not take money just because somebody's willing to give it to you. Remember the odd. Do you believe the law of market failure? Yeah, most new ideas fail. Do you believe it applies to you or are you so special? <laughs> it applies to you. It applies to all of us. Yes. Um, actually, I had one question, but in your other comment, like really stirred it up. So like, would you consider Fire Festival a XYZ? <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Okay, for those of you who don't know, Fire Festival is a kind of like a su- super hip hoppy, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, and they were all on an island and they got sandwiches. Yeah, yeah all right. So, <laughs> now, no, that, that uh, I consider fraud, <laughs> uh, which is a, a very different thing, right? So, they didn't, uh, along, what, what is that, uh, uh, that startup that had the, the medical stuff that, uh, oh, Theranos. yeah, Theranos, right? So, that's a very different scenario. So, there are situations where there is huge demand. I mean, suppose you, you pick a bad disease and have a cure. You think there is a market for it? Obviously. Right? So remember the slogan is, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. So in the case of the, the fire festival, right, clearly there was enough interest, but they didn't look at uh, the actual viability of the product. By the way, those of you familiar with design thinking, right, there are the three pillars. Desirability, do people want it? Viability, uh, will, can we make money with it? And feasibility, can we b- build it? Right? So you have to have all of those three. I focus on the desirability part, right? In the case of the Fire Festival and of Theranos, I think the problem was one of feasibility. Because even viability, they could make money. They just couldn't build uh, that device. And, but do you think that somebody will come up with a Theranos-like device that actually works in the future? Yeah, so what Theranos did, th- that is still kind of OPD. You have to do your own research and confirm it, but they kind of established that there is a market there. Dan, you tell me how many questions, you know, I could go on all night, but... All right, enjoy this. Hi, uh, let's say uh, you did your best, but your product still failed. Yeah. I'm just curious, what's your take on a failure? How to handle it? I mean, it's easy I, to say, yeah, move on, but... Then. Uh, I am partial to red wine. <laughs> and if it's a really bad 
failure a single malt scotch, <laughs> right? And uh, lock yourself in the bathroom and cry. No. <laughs> Look, the, uh, I, I explain this very clearly in the book, right? So if you practice preto tapping, what, you will be able to flip the odds for success in your failure, right? So if you do all of these things, instead of 80% uh, chance of failing, I mean, if all the data lands for you, you have an 80% chance of success, stuff may still happen, right? So I had these friends that had this company, everything lined up beautiful, beautifully, they, and, and this is a, cat, a sad story, they launched their product on 9-11 in New York. So that was their big launch, right? So. Uh, Sometimes things happen that, you know, and by the way, and if you remember what happened in the months afterward, you know, nobody was going out and buying stuff. So that can pretty much put you out of business. But there's a difference between failing because you were stupid. Say, you mean you built all this without testing that there is a market first? I said, yeah, well, that you feel bad about that. You should feel bad. And it's another, you know, you should feel different if you said, look, I've done everything right and I just got unlucky, right? If you're playing poker, and you have four aces, would you go big? Would you bet big on that? Yeah. Yes, right. Is it the right thing to bet big? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so somebody has a straight flush. No, what is it called? Yeah. Royal no, Royal a royal flush. Okay. And it beats you. So that's one in 72,000 chances and you lost. You still did the right thing, right? You, you, you're not going to feel like a fool because what were the odds of that happening? Yeah, so if it fails, kind of dust yourself off and leave, unless you live in countries in Europe where you are put in entrepreneurial uh, uh, jail and uh, Move on to the next one. Um, so I can actually expand a little bit on uh, what happens in the pharmaceutical and biotech space with prototyping. Okay. So we, we had a pre-order that we posted before we were FDA cleared. And uh, FDA does get in touch with you. And about a year later, we had a spot check, which was unannounced. Uh, so everything turned out fine, but they control the advertising as well as your, your yeah. poll. So you have to be very, even if you're, uh, diligent about what you claim on the site and you're doing a pre-order, they shut you down from being able to even like collect information about it. That's right. So there are some industry, I would say, you know, medical industry, the insurance industry, the financial industry, where there are some regulations uh, that, you know, I may be tough to overcome. But one of the expressions that I also use, and be very careful because, you know, do not misinterpret it, is this, is ignore the law. Now, no, what do I mean by that? Is that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, right, and the law right now doesn't allow what you're doing, it, it's okay to ignore it until, you know, to prove that there is demand. Let, let's face it, when Uber started in New York, they were operating illegally. You know, when Google started working on the self-driving cars, the, the law said, you know, every car should be operated by a person in full possession on their faculty and with an alcohol level below 0.8. So, so the, the law, when you can start an idea, can be, you know, prohibit your idea, but if the idea actually has a market, remember if there's a market, there's a way, eventually the law uh, will change. In the case of pharmaceutical, there are many ways. Let's make the ear itch problem, which I just invented. If it's a real problem, I apologize, right? So I have ear itch and I invented this great medicine, ear itching. And to make sure that there is enough demand for ear itching, I want to prototype it. I don't actually have to announce that there is, uh, that I have a product, I could just Instead of money, I can collect people's time. I could say, look, if you suffer from ear itching, you can come in and you know, participate in this uh, meeting and we want to talk about option and how we can uh, prove it. And then if you announce to a thousand people and three people show up, you realize, yes, their ears itch, but they probably don't want to spend time to fix it. So there's, there's always a way. I had uh, two questions. I'll try to keep it real short. Uh, the first one was when you're doing the infiltrator examples, You've got a third party there, like Safeway or Ikea. Yeah. How do you make it right with them? And then the second question was in a B2B space where you're selling to somebody that doesn't know that they have a problem, so they're not actively going out to try to solve that problem. Yeah. Is there any strategies that you have? Okay, for the, for the Ikea thing, first of all, you can ask permission, right? So some of my students actually, when we did this at Stanford, they, they, they invented this product called uh, Nightmare Bye Bye, pretending that, you know, it's a spray uh, aromatherapy that makes nightmares go by, right? And, uh, you know, so they, they infiltrated the Walgreens or whatever trying to do it. And I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You can ask permission, right? Maybe you don't get permission from Safeway or Walgreens, but you can do 12, you know, if you want to sell beer for dogs, you don't go into Petco, but you can go to the local pet store and say, hey, here's a hundred dollar. Can you try to see if you can sell uh, beer for dogs? For the, for the B2B uh, idea, I have a hard time 
answering questions that are very generic about a, you know, a generic B2B product. So uh, if you have a natural specific idea, hey, here's a B2B uh, idea, I can give you a more specific answer. Because every prototype has their own thing. But I would say, read the book. There are so many techniques there. Uh, and, and if you find a new one, even better. Invent your own. OK, I don't know who has the microphone. Hugh has the microphone. Exactly. Yes, I have the microphone. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very curious about your examples, some good examples in your career in software of prototyping. Pre well, pre I started doing prototyping after having my first failure, as I remember. Because I was so lucky that I was thinking I was a Stefano Giobini. Remember the Italian Steve Job? <laughs> so I thought that I was good, and all I had to do was my ideas were brilliant, and I had to execute them well, and they would uh, succeed. Uh, I haven't done personally much software. I work with company with software. I, had, I invented a product for doing uh, an audio product, which is a hardware product for a, a tone control to make digital music sound smoother and actually prototype that fully following exactly all of these things and it worked better. I prototype the book. Uh, everybody in my family prototypes. In fact, it doesn't have to be business. My daughter lived in Berkeley and she thought, I would like to move to some, in San Francisco, but I cannot afford a two bedroom apartment in San Francisco. So she said, huh, can I live in one bedroom apartment? How would she prototype it? She locked one of the rooms in Berkeley, right? And she lived for a month without you know, the study and said, OK, yeah, I can live with that. So she prototyped that. She prototyped not having a car by parking it in front of our house for, for six months and realizing yeah, I can get away with, with Uber. So once you see this technique, so many decisions in our life, we make them just thinking it's a good idea. Uh, but most things fail, not just most products, right? Most things in nature fail. Most mutations, right, uh, fail. We human beings, somehow we, you know, we kind of beat, uh, beat the odds. Most relationships fail, most products fail, but pretty much most things fail. So, uh, no, but now you have the tools to say, okay, since most things fail, let me go very cautiously and prototype this idea, right? You, would, you wouldn't marry somebody after dating them once, right? So, it, dating is an example of prototyping. Uh, and by the way, I have a, can, can I finish one last example? Uh, I have this thing I call best case and worst case scenario prototypes, right? So sometimes you want to get data that really you, you, people are convinced. So let's pick the Max Spaghetti example. So a worst case prototype, scenario prototype is the following, where I think that the idea is, cannot fail, that I create the worst possible situation, and if people still order it, then uh, I know that I have a winner. Right? And by the way, the, the original Tesla was a worst case prototype. I've never done a car company before. You need a charge in your garage. There are no charging stations around. And, and number two, and you have to wait two years for the car. If people still buy, that's a pretty strong signal. Right? A, a, worst, a best case scenario prototype is what I, may, I make the condition so that if you cannot sell it under the best possible condition, then you have no chance. Take Max Spaghetti. Okay? Not only do I put it in the menu, I play O Sole Mio in the background. You get a free bottle of wine with your Max Spaghetti, right? And it costs uh, 99 cents instead of $2. Now, if you cannot get people to order Max Spaghetti then, then we, you know, we kind of have a discussion. Now to have, yes, hi. Hi, Alberto. I wonder if you have prototyping experiences which you can share, which compare different business models. Uh, so it's some kind of A-B testing. Uh, pro I, I, what do you mean, business model like rent versus buy? Yeah, for example. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's actually pretty easy. First of all, I would create my XYZ hypothesis, right, with two different things. So Max Spaghetti, business model, Max Spaghetti of the month, <coughs> pass of the month at McDonald versus, you know, you just come it and order it. I would use exactly the same techniques because in, the, in that case, the difference is the business, uh, the business model. So it's a, yeah, the business model is, is kind of part of a product, right? Like who is it, the, the company Rolls Royce that sells, you know, in, instead of selling you the jet, they sell you, they sell you the power, right? What company is it? Rolls Royce, they sell the per hour. Oh yeah, you, you sell per hour. So those are hypotheses, right? So I say, well, I believe that if we sell power instead of actual engines, you know, people will buy, will use our engines more. And then you, you prototype and you actually see if that happens. Okay, how, what do you say? A couple more questions. Sure, two more. Sure. Yes. How would the prototyping model be different if it's a professional service versus a product? Ex same exact thing, right? Same exact thing. 
Uh, give, me, give me what professional business do you have in mind? I like a, a specific example. Consulting, like um, consulting of some kind, business consulting, strategy consulting. Okay, so that's that's pretty generic, right? So I say, uh, I uh, I'm gonna make one up that doesn't exist, right? So uh, I'm a cat psychologist. Yeah, I have a degree in psychology from uh, Stanford, and I'm the cat psychologist. And uh, so I wanna set up shop, and I believe that people will want to buy my cat service. So how would you prototype it, right? This is a service, you agree? How would you prototype the cat psychology service? You could do the website. Well, let's do it in the physical world, yeah, because the website is kind of easy. Pet shop. That's right. You go to a, you go to a pet shop and you go, or yeah, or, or else you, you go to your friends that have cats, but the pet shop is a perfect place. You go to a pet shop owner, pet shop owner right? I said, look, I'm doing some market research, here's a here's hundred dollars. I would like you to give, you make a hundred pamphlets, right? I'm a big believer in these things, right? Like this, right? So you make a hundred pamphlets that says, you know, Alberto the cat psychology, you know, Stanford train, you know, expert in uh, feline feelings, right? So you come up with a catchy <laughs> phrase. I just made that up now. <laughs> F feline feelings. So you give a hundred of these with, maybe you have the website and, and that. So you know that a hundred of these pamphlets went out and your hypothesis that 3% of people with cats would want a cat psychologist, you know, for $60 an hour over the phone, you can have a session with a cat, whatever your business model is. And then you get to see how many people come to the web uh, site. Same principle. Remember, oh, whatever it is starts with the XYZ hypothesis. 2% of cat owners uh, have cats who have problems with their feelings and uh, they can benefit from a cat psychologist. And I probably believe that this position this uh, actually exists. Okay, last question. Um, hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it's oh, you're really welcome. helpful. So uh, my question is talking about hypothesis, you said X percent of, yeah. yeah. So how do you measure the right X percentage? How do you know that you have the right? Uh, like okay, so good, so good question. Again, I, I explained in the book, the XYZ hypothesis says X percent of Y will do Z. Two percent, right? of why, who are, why is our target market? Crazy Silicon Valley cat owners, right? Because this is the kind of things that only happens in California, right? In Italy, you see a cat psychologist doesn't happen, but you know, in Los Angeles, probably you can make a very good living, right? So, so she and I decide to go in business. I say, okay, look, the hypothesis, I say 2% of people with, with, with cats will pay $60 an hour, uh, three times a month for a cat uh, psychology session over the phone. Right? Uh, so how do they come up with those numbers? At first it doesn't matter, it's, it's just a hypothesis, right? But by putting it into numbers, you're articulating. First, you and I agree what that number has to be, right? Maybe she thought, no, I think 20% of people would have, and I say 10%, and maybe she thinks, I cannot charge $60 for a cat, I have to charge 30. I said, well, you cannot do it for less than $60. So the very act of putting numbers down, you know, makes it concrete and allows you to have the discussion. Then when you do the experiment, don't worry, the market will adjust the numbers and then you have to find out if your idea is desirable, if you can make it viable, right? If the percentage is big enough. But start with some numbers, otherwise uh, you're just too fuzzy. All right, so with, with that, I think we can stop it and then you're gonna run the, the raffle yes, things. Yeah, just, please join me again in giving Alberto one. Thank you, Oscar, a great talk.